Hello and welcome back to the Walking Dead Retrospective, where today it is finally time for us to delve into the, I'll say, interesting Season 8 and the All Out War Saga. As I've been saying a lot lately, things here continue to diverge more and more, so many things will not necessarily translate or in some instances won't be even remotely close. So don't be too surprised by that and that will only become more commonplace. But enough dilly-dallying, let us get right into it. As per usual, a new season means a look at the wider state of the franchise and all the promo around the season. And the first thing to note here is that Season 8 was coming right off of the heels of Fear the Walking Dead Season 3, which in the eyes of many is up there with the peaks of the mainline series. So after the very arduous journey that was Season 7, I think many fans were extremely excited to see if we've bounced back from the slump that was the early Negan arc. And on top of that, in what has to be some of the funniest promo ever, we got the announcement that following the backlash in Season 7, Season 8 would have less bottle episodes. So all things considered, everything was indeed looking up. And then when actual promo with the infamous All Out War tagline begin popping up, I think it's safe to say that everyone was excited. Which brings us on to Comic-Con and the trailer, which, I'll say it right now, is one that I am still extremely conflicted on. In terms of giving us a sneak peek of all the craziness that we see in the season, I think it absolutely nails it. But my biggest problem with it is that it has no grit. Everything just feels too happy, if that makes sense. Obviously, rising up against Negan was a triumph, but with Prisoner's Song, with which I think the symbolism is very on the nose, and the somewhat whimsical editing like the Trust the King scene, I can't help but think that the tone is way, way off. Trust the King. To give you another point of reference, compare the Season 3 and 4 trailers, which were also about finding a safe haven, to this one, which is a literal war. Why is going into what is hands down the biggest conflict so far such a joyful ride, while finding the prison, which was by all accounts their best chance of survival, was still focused on the horror aspect and the unknown that lurks inside the prison? In the grand scheme of things, it of course doesn't change much, it's just a trailer after all. But I do think that it was some unfortunate foreshadowing of the tone of the wider season, which of course we'll get to plenty more later on. And of course, the big after credits scene in this one is the old man Rick flash forward, which every comic book fan knows very, very well. Thing is, and I don't know if this is just my incorrect read on the situation, this gave me the impression that All Out War would be wrapped up very, very quickly. Even in interviews, the old Gimple said that the war will absolutely be done by the end of the season, which in my mind hinted more so at it ending even sooner. So in that sense, I think my expectations at least were pretty off already going into the season. Which nicely brings us on to the pacing and the adaptation ratio. If you remember what I said in Season 7, it was the slowest season to date only after Season 2. Well, that was to date, because Season 8 is even slower, adapting a very nice 0.69 issues per episode. For context, Season 10, which had an extra 6 episodes, many of which were 100% filler, still had double the adaptation ratio of Season 8. So, with all that said, I for one very much got my expectations annihilated because with us seeing the flash forward of Rick, the promise of less bottle episodes, and the fact that the initial stages of the war were drastically stretched out, I didn't even think it was out of the range of possibility that it would be wrapped up in time for Christmas. That was a joke, by the way. The first half of the season always ends before Christmas. It's, it's funny, trust me. And the very last thing I want to discuss before we jump into the story itself are the ratings. Because the Season 8 premiere would mark the lowest viewers of a premiere since all the way back in Season 3. And as of right now, it is also the final episode to ever break 10 million live viewers. So number-wise, the glory days have truly ended. And of course, I know I'll get comments about this, but as I always say, obviously take all of these numbers with a pinch of salt, as this was also around the time where streaming was getting super big, and viewing habits were generally changing a lot. But I do still think that they offer a very good representative view of the series' performance overall, which I think to everybody who was active in the community can also be supported by purely anecdotal evidence. Based on Reddit activity and everything else like that, activity was generally on a downward trend. 
The numbers are obviously not exact, especially with piracy and all that, but in terms of the trend, this is where they start dropping, and unfortunately, dropping fast. But finally moving into the story itself, in both versions we open right where we left off. The first counterattack of the joint communities has happened and Negan is driven back to the sanctuary. Only major difference is, is that in the show, we immediately jump to Rick addressing all the communities and the attack basically opens in full swing. Which I think also represents a lot of what we'll be talking about with the season in general. I've mentioned it a lot already, but with the conflict in the TV version, I think they got way too caught up with the action which made a lot of these moments fall flat compared to the book. And I think this is already a case of that. In the books, we open the next issue with Rick and Andrea simply talking in their bedroom, which clearly has that uneasy and ominous tone as they talk about how this is the big day. This is the biggest thing they've ever done after all. And I think these scenes just before the floodgates open embody that very well. Obviously, the show had already dragged out the march to war to a ridiculous extent, but I think a lot of the weight of what's about to go down is already somewhat diminished in the show, which again, also loops back to the general tone that we saw in the trailer. This is a triumph, sure, but I think everything was just too upbeat, if that makes sense. In the book, this attack opens with Rick openly doubting himself and saying, this is the biggest thing we've ever done. This is dangerous. Whereas in the show, it's your typical heroic speech about how this is a challenge to overcome. But another very important thing to note is that the season 8 premiere marked episode 100, which is obviously a ridiculous milestone for any series to reach. And very fittingly, there are many, many parallels to the very first episode in the series. For instance, Carl searching for gas essentially replicates the opening shot of the first episode, basically one for one. Which if you ask me, in retrospect, seems almost hilarious considering he ends up dying in a few episodes. So the whole new generation parallel here falls flat basically right away. But anyway, Addie Miller, the little girl walker that Rick shoots in the premiere, also makes a return as a zombie with some resemblance to the original. Then of course there are the flash forwards where Rick is waking up in an unknown location, just like we saw with Atlanta way way back. There are plenty more to the premiere specifically, and of course also plenty more to later seasons as well. For example, Carl carrying the orange backpack they got from the hitchhiker they didn't help in Season 3. Rick also takes pictures of the sanctuary after their attack, just like the saviors did of Glenn, etc, etc. I'm sure there are countless more references that even to this day people still haven't picked up on, but I do like all the subtle callbacks to signify such an incredible milestone. As for the attack itself, in many ways it is similar, but at the same time, the wider story differs substantially. In the book, even before the entire attack begins, we get another roundup of checkups with our important characters. We see that Michonne and Ezekiel have gotten together, we see Andrea talk to Carl about how he's responsible for defending Alexandria, especially because he was the one who put together their first counterattack, and we see Eugene already producing bullets. Something that would be of vital importance in the books, but was seemingly forgotten for most of Season 8. And of course, the whole arcade aspect of the war is one we'll be returning to a lot. Another sizable change is that in the book, there was never any large-scale walker kiting or anything like that. Because they're already right by Washington and we already saw what gunfire can do in No Way Out, the whole plan is just to make sufficient noise and organically draw in the walkers. Personally, in this case, I far, far prefer how the comic handled it, mostly because everything about it just feels, again, more organic. We know that walkers are attracted to noise, and that's it. It's not an overly bombastic dance with rigged explosives and whatnot. Everything about it just generally felt more grounded, in my opinion. So while the whole kiting the walkers sequence was cool, for me, it just once again seemed like spectacle for the sake of spectacle. Probably my favorite part about this entire thing in the show is that it just demonstrates how good the survivors have become at managing walkers. Because remember that they've now done it multiple times with varying degrees of success. As for the attack itself, there are also some notable changes. First off, Maggie is actually there in the show as a representative of the hilltop. Whereas in the book, she stays behind and Jesus is there essentially in her place. As I've already said a few times before, I think all of these remixes of pushing Maggie into the forefront earlier in the show are just good changes that made her entire transition into becoming the leader feel much more natural. So it's generally just leveraging the benefit of hindsight from the books. 
Secondly, because they aren't kiting any hordes or anything like that, basically anyone they can muster up is present at the attack. Whereas in the show, they're quite a bit more scattered. And importantly, even before the attack begins, we get an explicit mention of watching the windows as Negan has snipers. Whereas in the show, this is not mentioned at all. Also, in the book, Rick is the only one to fire off a warning shot. Whereas in the show, they all do the synchronized wasting of bullet, I mean synchronized warning shots. In terms of Negan's appearance, since most of his lieutenants are TV show exclusive, he walks out alone and, similar to the show, drags out Gregory as a bargaining chip. And here is where everything changes very, very quickly. In the show, Rick is the one to pull the Giga Chad move and starts counting down until he just begins firing. But in the book, Negan's people are the ones to open the attack and the survivors are quickly pinned down, letting Negan escape. And this is a perfect example of how Negan's plot armor in the show is even stronger than a dumpster, because this makes zero sense. As much as we can do mental gymnastics saying that killing Negan here would ruin the story, etc, etc, fact of the matter is, the entire confrontation is just sloppy writing. But don't take my word for it. Both Greg Nicotero and Jeffrey Dean Morgan spoke up about how Negan doesn't even get scathed here. And I quote, We have a hundred people there and none of them actually shoot anybody. Everything about this just feels extremely sloppy, especially when you look back at the battle sequences we've seen already. Don't forget that the entire Woodbury battle was TV show exclusive. And in my eyes, it was magnitudes better than this one because here, I just had a hard time taking anything seriously. Why they opted to change it from the book where it was very clear how he escaped? Well, that is beyond me. And same goes for the windows. In the book, even after they are explicitly mentioned at the start, we see Negan ask, all the snipers already took cover, why are they still shooting the windows? Which we of course know to be them pulling more walkers to the sanctuary and simply keeping the snipers pinned down while they do so. In the show, on the other hand, it is just never brought up. So even though the intention is essentially identical to the book, it has gone down in infamy because of how it was portrayed. Not once did we hear that there are snipers up there. So it legitimately looks like instead of shooting at Negan, they are choosing to shoot at the windows to kite the walkers, which again, just makes very little sense considering there is an entire team of people doing that already. So yes, we are off to a pretty dicey start to All Out War right from the get-go. And of course, the broken window theory here is applicable as well. But in-universe, was that really worth hundreds of bullets? I don't think so. So point is, all of this could have been solved with a simple 5 second scene of talking about the snipers and how they need to keep them pinned down. Simple as that. As for the rest of the attack, in the book, the goal was always for Rick to go through the gates and trap the saviors in the sanctuary. The belief was that Negan would never touch Rick, so as long as they managed to decisively win the rest of the conflicts, Rick himself would never be touched because again, Negan does not want to create a martyr. But Holly steps in at the last moment and essentially just forces Rick to stay behind, going in herself. And this is where the whole Sasha thing which we talked about last time happens in the book. As for the show, quite a few things here are changed. First off, Rick stays around even as the Horde appears, continuing to shoot at Negan. None of that happens in the book and all of them fall back as soon as their goal of luring the herd was complete. Also, Gabriel's role in this entire thing is heavily remixed because in the show, he of course tries saving Gregory and ultimately ends up stuck with Negan. None of this happens in the book. And the last thing in this entire attack is what happens after they fall back. Because in the show, we snap right to other battles already being planned, whereas in the book, this was such a heavy blow that we linger on it for a bit and don't quite jump right into other battles. Instead, we hear Rick basically make it official that this is just the beginning, and some of them are sent back to Alexandria in case the saviors manage to retaliate sooner than expected. And just before we move on, there are two small things which I thought were very nice touches in these episodes. First off, the armbands signifying which community they all belong to, which is a surprising bit of logic in this war. Okay, I'll promise I'll stop clowning on it. Eventually. And two, the shot of Dwight and a walker we get obviously signifying the whole two-faced nature of his character in case him literally having two sides of his face wasn't clear enough. Oh, okay, and one more thing. 
When I began working on the season's coverage and rewatched the season, I got a really weird sense of nostalgia and I wonder whether any of you have had it as well. Obviously, when I was watching the first seasons and working on these videos, I am 100% filled with nostalgium and everything's groovy. But when I got to season 7, I knew we were entering the rocky times of the series and the usual nostalgia did dissipate a little. But on my rewatch of season 8, something about seeing Rick's final hurrah seriously hit me. Especially because this is also the last season before the pretty heavy revamp we'd see in season 9. So yeah, do let me know whether this is another case of me being weirdly sentimental, or is season 8 also bizarrely nostalgic for you despite the bad rap that it gets. Following the attack, we follow up with Holly and Gabe that are now in the sanctuary. We already covered most of what happens with Holly last time, so I won't rehash that again. But an interesting angle that we see here is that Negan confuses her for Andrea and fully expects Rick to come barging through the gates to save her saying that she clearly sacrificed herself because she loves Rick and wouldn't allow him to go through the gates alone. And even as she fires back saying she loved Abraham, the man who got a bolt through his head from Dwight, Negan's still not quite convinced. And it's only after she basically smirks in his face saying that Andrea is back home healing that he is convinced. As for the show, obviously things are a bit different by default since Eugene is also at the sanctuary, so the whole Gabriel drama is a bit remixed. Some of Negan's iconic lines like the <coughs> pants are remixed for his speech to Gabe instead of Dwight, and a few other small changes like that. Returning to the Alliance though, Episode 2 is basically a hodgepodge of random attacks on all fronts. The strategy aspect was a little more explicit in the box, which we'll get to in a second, but I think this was an episode that seriously says a lot about how silly this whole thing would turn out. I know it would be a ridiculous amount of work, but I'd love for someone to just go through and count how many people we see here, and better yet, how many rounds are fired off here. Because with this literally being just the second episode, this war will very quickly become way too much to believe. The Walking Dead fan wiki lists off at least 89 deaths in this series, which I think you'll agree is ridiculous. And yes, it's not even the first place in terms of deaths. But during all of these attacks, Aaron's boyfriend Eric is shot and bleeds out in the TV version, while in the bulk he is just shot in the head, killing him instantly. So, let us drop our many Fs for Eric. Another huge development here happens with Rick and Daryl. We see them clearing this house and fighting off a few saviors, which is very cool and all, but suddenly Rick is caught off guard by a familiar voice. None other than Morales. And oh boy, did the internet catch fire here. For those of you who might have joined the series sometime later on, the what happened to Morales joke had been going very, very strong ever since season 1. And as unrealistic as it may seem, I think it's safe to say that a lot of people thought it would be interesting for him to be brought back into the story. And after the episode aired, we actually got some interviews that talked about how originally, his return was apparently already planned sometime in the Glen Mazara era. But for one reason or another, the plans just never went through. But, as you already know, literally the next episode opens with him being killed off a few seconds later, which... why? If bringing him back was just fan service, why make a big deal out of it in the first place? Reintroducing a character who literally started by Rick's side way back in Atlanta would have been the absolutely perfect way of showing how drastically different their stories were. Something that we would never see in the comic book, but no. Instead of exploring that, he is killed off and we get more people shooting in random directions. Based on his media presence at least, Morales' actor, whose name I don't want to butcher, actually wanted to return to the show for a while. So in my eyes, this was just a massive missed opportunity. If he were to survive and Carl would end up dying just a few episodes later, imagine how Morales and Rick might have reconnected since both of them had now lost their children. Or actually not even their children, their entire family from Atlanta. But again, nope, we just kill him off. Why? No one knows. Hello, editing Kuroto jumping in. One thing I forgot to mention is that Gracie is also rescued here, but she does not exist in the book. So everything like Aaron taking her in, etc, etc, all of that is TV show exclusive. Though moving on, in both versions we then switch focus to Ezekiel, which is where we also see something very, very different. 
So far with the comic book, we've talked a lot about how there are basically zero flashbacks and everything is simply a retelling, right? Well here, we see a sort of a remix between the two, as we get the narration by Ezekiel overlaid on all the events he's describing. This sort of approach is actually super rare for the comic book, but I think it worked really well here, and also maintained that ominous vibe I've talked about already that is present throughout. As for the show, instead of it being a retelling, we see the whole thing through, from the very start of the attack, to them being ambushed, and to their ultimate demise. And I'll say it right now, this part of the war was done incredibly well. I'd go even as far as to say that this might just be the best part of the war in the TV version. The whole, I'm just some guy angle perfectly encapsulated the message of the comic, where Ezekiel outwardly says that he quickly realized he is not a combat leader at all, and it perfectly leveraged the medium to make the whole Shiva sequence hit that much harder. There is a lot of filler in there, which I don't think we really ever needed to see, but aside from that, an incredible sequence through and through. And because animals are indisputably better than humans, big Fs for Shiva. She will never be forgotten. And before we move on, I want to take a very quick pit stop here and talk about the pacing of the season so far. Because it might feel like we're zooming past a lot of the events. But that's the thing. A vast majority of the back and forth we see in the show is purely padding. The comic book just essentially showed us the important events like the initial attack, Holly being captured, Ezekiel losing their assault, and so far that is basically it. And this is where we can address something I've brought up before, adapting action sequences. The thing with taking manga or comics to life is that an entire page of back and forth fighting has to happen fast, otherwise it just loses all meaning in terms of action. And so the comic book is actually deceptively short, because a lot of the panels we see are purely to show the fight from multiple angles. But time-wise, it's no more than a few minutes. So going into Season 8, I for one had the assumption that the pacing would actually be more akin to Season 3, purely because of how action-centric the story actually was. But that was absolutely not the case. And so, to maintain that feeling of action, the show simply opted to add 50 more fighting sequences that ultimately add nothing but spectacle. Particularly when watching these episodes with the benefit of hindsight, it just feels like there are like 15 minutes of people getting shot that ultimately contribute absolutely nothing to the narrative. Yeah, like 30 people die. But we literally know none of them, and then 10 minutes later, we see 50 more people pop up anyway. And so in a bizarre turn of events, and I know this is going to sound weird, the breakneck action in these scenes feels slow. I really have no other way of putting it. The scenes are fast, but they are slow because they don't mean anything. It's just shaky cam running around, people firing, basically a action flick where nothing really matters. And especially in a show like The Walking Dead that has always been at least somewhat grounded in realism, all of those problems are just that much more visible. And speaking of which, we still have a bunch of add-ins to cover in the show, first of which being the entire chase sequence with Rick Darrell and the Saviors. And oh boy, is this the perfect example of what I mean. Trust me when I say I could not care less about guns being realistic in 99% of circumstances as long as it at least makes sense. But I'm sorry, this scene is just plain dumb. Let me get this straight. You're telling me that a mounted machine gun that is at best 50 meters ahead of them didn't instantly turn Rick into Swiss cheese or better yet just annihilate his car? And then Daryl gets him in 3 seconds flat with a handgun? I get cool action scenes, but I watch John Wick for this sort of stuff, not The Walking Dead. Like literally, all of Ezekiel's group was annihilated by this exact weapon. What are we even doing here? And of course, big surprise, nothing remotely close to this happens in the book. All the attacks are small and scrappy missions, not fully stocked heavy weaponry sieges. And also, we don't see people just randomly run off on their own. All of these are coordinated strikes on the outposts, and we don't have like half of the cast running off on their own little missions literally by themselves. Including Carl, who is literally stumbling around by himself in the middle of a war, because, you know, fun. I do actually think that the clashing morals within the group are an interesting touch here, as they would inevitably crop up. But I think the show just went seriously overboard on basically all of it, and it's just a mess. 
But anyway, another add-in for the show is a lot of the focus we get on Negan and Gabriel. We do get some hints towards Negan's backstory and his wife in this one as he talks to Gabe, but a vast majority of this is added for the show. That said, I do think that this one did a great job of showing us how Negan is actually keeping people like Simon in check, which would of course be on full display later in the season as well. We've already seen glimpses of how Simon is actually much more unhinged and sometimes doesn't necessarily even follow Negan, so in that sense, a very interesting addition if you ask me. Another remix of course stems from our Dr. Smarty Pants, Eugene. In the book, he is producing bullets to make this entire war even possible. But because we've still got our infinite ammo toggle from Herschel in the show, this is of course not a worry and he is still chilling at the sanctuary. So all the talk we get with Negan about figuring out how they'll get out of the sanctuary is essentially given to Eugene, with whom we also get some more additional drama as Dwight tries to stop his plans and all that. In the book, we get absolutely none of this. The closest thing is just Negan gathering up his men and saying to rotate out as they clear the walkers from the Alliance's first walker bomb attack. We essentially see Negan and his dudes try the old prison clearing hand-to-hand -hand method, but there's just way too many of them, so they opt to take it slow. And the last add-in to mention for the show is of course the helicopter, which both continues in the long list of callbacks to the first season, as well as sets up the whole CRM business we'd get to later on. Another set of add-ins is everything to do with the trash folk. Of course, absolutely none of this happens in the book, and as I've already said many times before, I seriously did not care for any of this at all. As with many things in this season, the whole back and forth just feels like pointless padding. In the bigger story, it does of course turn out to be massively important because it ultimately results in Rick being taken, the whole world beyond story, the CRM and all that jazz, but when taken in isolation, Really not anything terribly exciting, neither on initial viewing, nor in retrospect in my opinion at least. Though we'll get to that a whole bunch more next time as it would play into the mid-season finale. Speaking of the mid-season finale though, another thing to note is the story around Carl and Sadiq. I know I've been a negative Andy a lot today, but I don't think you'll be surprised when I say that when I was re-watching this, I wasn't exactly excited to see it. We do see plenty more callbacks here, which were cool and all, but obviously all of that is overshadowed by everything that comes next, which is of course Carl's death. We'll leave that entire debate for next time, because there's a lot to say there, but obviously none of this happens in the book. For this entire situation, Carl is back at Alexandria in case the saviors retaliate, and that is it. That might seem like an awfully long time in the background, but you have to remember that despite us being six episodes deep into the season, we're actually only like three or four issues into the war, so the pacing is quite a bit different too. As for Sadiq, I do actually think that his character was super interesting, but again, as much as I may like him, clearly he is overshadowed by Carl's death. And I think it's pretty easy to say that as a trade-off, a lot of people would have picked Carl over Sadiq. Not because he isn't cool, but because Carl's story is literally the story of The Walking Dead, but you know. Not to mention that he isn't even around for that much longer afterwards, but yeah, we'll get to it a lot more when we reach the mid-season finale. Another thing that I haven't mentioned yet is everything going on with Maggie and Gregory. Here the events are essentially quite similar. Gregory returns to the hilltop claiming to be super tired and that he walked all the way here and whatnot. But Maggie just clowns on him, and this is also where the Maggie whacking him scene happens that was moved earlier in the show. As we've already seen a few times, this is just another case of Maggie slowly becoming the definitive leader of the Hilltop. And while the show does remix a few more things here and there, with the Saviors also being a part of the equation, broadly speaking, it's the same deal in both versions. Gregory is a clown and is being replaced as the Hilltop's leader. So the biggest change here is that in the book, so far, there are no prisoners of war as there are in the show. And for the sake of simplicity, this is where we'll leave it for today, because the next couple of episodes have a number of huge changes that I don't want to cram in here at the very, very end. As is trend at this point, I won't try to sum up the differences because there are simply way, way too many to list off, but tonally, i just say that the comic book feels much more grounded and gritty compared to the 300% action flick that the show is at this point, especially with things like the highway chase sequence. And because you've made it to the very, very end, I can reveal a secret to you, and yes, I do sound like Darth Vader because I am still quite a bit sick, and that is because I recorded the last episode's outro literally half an hour ago. So yes, that's a rare insight into how I work. I try to work in advance as much as possible because these take a lot of work. 
Anyway, that said, next time we'll be delving into Negan's retaliation and everything that entails, which as many of you will know, is remixed to a ridiculous degree both in terms of the events and their order as well as the pace of the rest of the war. And that's the video. Probably the wackiest one in the series so far, but sorry, I just can't help but try to get some cheap laughs out of the not so great parts of the series for me. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.